Um, so you know what? Let's get started. Um, uh, it's it's really great to have you all here. We've uh, this is kind of a combo of the uh, uh, Fernando Meza Meza students from the uh, uh, university um, in Minneapolis, University of Minnesota, and also uh, Bill Morsh's students from the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana, and um, and then uh, we we have um, Lester Godinez from Guatemala and S. K. Kakraba, who's tuning in from uh, Los Angeles, originally from uh, Ghana. So, just a, a brief uh, description of why this is happening. Uh, I've called it the evolution of the marimba, and uh, it was actually uh, uh, came to my attention because uh, our fearless leader at the University of Toronto Percussion Studio is Ayun Wong, and she held a uh, a Zoom meeting with the students uh, after the uh, the terrible incident that happened in Minneapolis uh, uh, with the killing, the brutal killing of George uh, Floyd and um, uh, the Ayun asked what what um, what can we do to you know better the situation what can we do um, uh, to ha have a more inclusive percussion studio and one of the students responded by saying um, you know, we're playing all this repertoire from the 20th century 21st century on instruments, but we don't know uh, where the instruments come from. We don't know the history of the instrument or the evolution of the instrument. So, the, so that kind of piqued my interest. And because of my own interest with the marimba, I thought it might be a good idea to get together some people that I know who are also very passionate about the instrument. So that's how, why we have Fernando, Lester, uh, Bill Morsh and uh, SK here to share their um, expertise. Um, so um, I, without further ado, I'm just going to uh, ask Fernand to, to be the first one to step up to the plate. Uh, I will read a bit of a bio about Fernando. I'm just going to make it short. Uh, so he is the Associate Professor of the University of Minnesota School of Music, where he has been Director of Percussion Studies since 1993. Over this time period, he has built and established in Minneapolis what is considered by many to be one of the most comprehensive centers of percussion studies in the United States. Professor Meza began musical studies in his hometown of Costa Rica in 1972. Uh, he holds a master's degree from the University of Michigan, and uh, he studied with many uh, well-known percussionists, Stuart Mars, uh, John Soroka, Michael Udow, to name a few. Uh, he is recognized for his versatility as a performing artist and teacher, as well as someone who is involved in creatively expanding the art form of music in general and of percussion in particular. To this end, one of his most important contributions to date was the organization and presentation of the Marimba 2010 International Festival and Conference, a three and a half day event which brought together over 50 of the world's leading marimba artists in collaboration with the most important artistic organizations in the Twin Cities for an unprecedented event which reached over 10,000 people through performances in the most important venues in the area. So so welcome, Fernando, and I was hoping you could talk a bit about that festival, and then you have a PowerPoint presentation about uh, uh, the Costa Rican marimbas. Sure. Well, thank, thank you for that introduction, uh, Beverly. It's, it's, of course, a pleasure to, to see you again and, and to be here with my, with my colleagues and good friends, you know, Lester uh, and Bill Mersh and SK Kakraba. I'm just meeting today, so it's also a pleasure to meet him. Um, and yeah, that you know that that festival. I, I'll I'll make it fairly quickly. You know, here just the because we have a lot of people to get through and a lot of information to to share with everybody. But the Marimba Festival in 2010 that I organized was basically a a crazy dream. Basically, that's all it was for me. It was it was something that had been in my head for you know about a, a long time for about 15 years. And every time I talked with different colleagues around the the world about this idea of, of creating an international festival just for the marimba where we could bring the very best you know players and, and teachers and so on of the marimba and builders and um and th they all thought it was a great idea but they all thought i was crazy so i tried <laughs> to give this idea to everyone i tried to give it even to the percussive arts society they were not you know they were not willing to pursue it 
So I just told myself, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen just because I'm going to have to dive into the deep end of the pool and just do it myself. So I organized it. It took me three years, believe it or not, uh, and, and very intense three years of work uh, to make everything happen. But in the end, we brought 52 of the world's leading artists um, for, for a really uh, incredible event. Um, so, you know, 15 world premieres later and, and, you know, lots of, you know, connections with all the artistic groups, Minnesota Orchestra, St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, um, you know, Vocal Essence, Professional Choir, and all the major presenters in the Twin Cities. Um, and there was marimba, you know, every, in every venue for three and a half days here, which was, which was pretty amazing. And all of all except SK Kakraba, whom I didn't know at the time. Otherwise, I would have loved to have had him too. But everyone here, you know, Bill Marsh and Beverly and Lester were all present uh, for that festival. So yeah, it was a great. It was great to do that. So, um, but you know, I, I'm happy to answer questions about that later. I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I like to go through. So I'm going to share my screen here. So I'm going to uh, talk uh, with you guys today. A, a little bit about the marimba in Costa Rica, which is home for me, uh, or you know my home home country. I was I was born there and grew up there, studied music until I was 17 before I came to the U.S. And um, the marimba. Let me actually do this. I have this in a better format there. Oh yeah. Okay. So the marimba is actually the national instrument in Costa Rica. You will also, of course, hear this uh, in a bit from Lester Godinez too, who. Uh, who, from Guatemala, uh, the marimba actually has an, an even bigger tradition in Guatemala than it does in Costa Rica. And of course, Lester can tell you all about that in a bit. We in Costa Rica kind of inherited the marimba somehow from Guatemala, uh, but it is the national instrument. Now, the marimba in Costa Rica is different than, than, than the one you know, be, than the concert marimba, but we'll get into that in a second. So the location, first of all, of Costa Rica is Costa Rica is located in the Central American Isthmus here, which, you know, you guys are up here in Canada, of course, or the U.S. If you keep going south and you go through Mexico, then you get into the Isthmus of Central America, starting in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua here, and then Costa Rica, then Panama, and of course, later you go here into South America, okay, Colombia, Venezuela, etc. Uh, in Costa Rica, the area that I'm going to focus on is right here. Uh, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, the area of Nicoya and Santa Cruz, but in particular, the city of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is considered the, the, the national, um, oh man, how do I get rid of this thing? There, that's better. Okay, that's a little better. Santa Cruz is considered the, the, the land of the Costa Rican folklore. And if you, if you see the, the seal of the city, there are two things that I want you to notice here. One is this marimba. And the other one is this um, black Christ. Uh, I will get into that in a second. Um, uh oh, what happened? There you go. Uh, in Santa Cruz, there is a monument to the marimba, and that monument has a plaque. I will I will let all of you read this quickly uh, because I I've always I've always thought that that's a, a pretty uh, special thing. You know that there is actually a plaque that talks about the character of the sound of the instrument. And it even says, sharpen up your role. So the, they even talk about the technique of the marimba, which is kind of crazy. But uh, this is at the, at the base of, of this monument, you know, as you, you can see it right here. So that plaque is right there. But in Santa Cruz, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things. Oh, this is a, um, I'll talk about this in a second too, that I've taken a few groups to Costa Rica. That was, um, in 2016, I believe. But Santa Cruz is a very small town, you know, compared to a very small city. Uh, and the marimba takes a very important part in the culture of that, uh, of that city. Uh, so all of these things are, are part of the culture of Santa Cruz. Um, if, if you can see this, uh, the marimba orchestra, well, you can read that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this uh, because I don't know how many times you guys may have played in front of a crowd like this. But...
okay so that's that's uh uh i'll tell you about the event that that uh where i where i filmed that uh there is also in santa cruz now a very important um proposition for this conservation of woods that are needed um in order to make marimbas in order to make the mallets um in order to make the 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 frames for the instrument and the and the resonator boxes etc so um i don't maybe i put this down i don't know where to put this thing <laughs> okay um there are 23 and a half acres now that um this project has uh, appropriated to cultivate woods that are needed for for that you know the cristobal is the wood that is used for the keyboards cedro is which is a type of cedar is used for the furniture basically of the the frame and the resonator boxes and the guaitil is made is what is used for making the mallets fernando i hate to interrupt but um uh, bill was wondering are you still on the first slide are you uh, we're oh. on sent Sorry, I am no, I am I am passing all the slides. Are you not able to see my screen? No, no. Yes. Oh, what the heck? Okay, uh, 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 Tim, are are you there? I, oh, I'm not sure. I can see your. I can see your screen, but it's still on the first slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, Let's... you might want to consider uh, like resharing. Sometimes this happens with yeah. with uh, sharing PowerPoint screens. Here, there we go. Okay, let's try that. Does that work now? That's working. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll go through the slides quickly and then I'll catch up. So this is the location of Costa Rica. I'm so sorry. Okay. So I talked about that, the, the isthmus, right? Then the, the city where we're going to be talking about right now is Santa Cruz right here. And, and now you can see, yes, everything's okay. Yes. So I'm assuming that it is unless I hear otherwise. We were up to the fountain and the plaque. Okay, um, so this are this is the, the, the I don't know if you saw this, but this is the seal of the city of Santa Cruz, and the marimba in this black Christ of Esquipulas is there. Then um, the plaque. So then you didn't get to read the plaque, right? Correct. I, I'll I'll let you read this one then uh, quickly. Um, uh oh, and somebody's at my door. Well, you guys read that. Like, t sorry, one second. Okay, read the plaque. Okay, yeah, read the plaque. The plaque is there. Yeah. I just there's somebody dropping off a package here. Okay. Um, then um, I just mentioned that I had taken several students to Costa Rica over the years, and that's over at the Monument of the Marimba. There are roads that are dedicated to the Marimba in Santa Cruz. And there's, you know, this bus that is owned by a Marimba Orchestra. Uh, in the video that I played, you probably heard it but didn't see it then, okay? So I just I'll just play just a little bit of that again so you can see. With, with dry ice and everything. <laughs> um, I was talking about the forest right now, and I was showing you this, this slide right here. This is a project that uh, started in 2017 uh, that's dedicated to the plantation of woods um, required to make marimbas and or mallets. Uh, so um, it's, it's, a new, it's a new thing uh, and, and hopefully it will survive. Um, it's a long-term project, of course. But now to the, to the origins of the instrument in Costa Rica. The, this instrument that you see here, the, the bow marimba, the marimba de arco, uh, we don't really have this instrument so much in Costa Rica anymore, but it's, it, it, we used to have it, and it used to be played more. In Nicaragua, Costa Rica's northern uh, neighbor, uh, is still a big tradition. So you do find this instrument um, in Nicaragua quite a bit, and it's a beautiful instrument. Um, single keyboard, of course, and we do have single keyboard instruments in Costa Rica um, that, like, like you see here, um, there are, of course, um, chromatic marimbas, you know, which we all know. The only difference, of course, and I want you to pay attention to this, is that the keyboard of the traditional instrument 
is not laid out like the piano which is really a freaky thing when you go to play that instrument because if you're used to playing on a concert marimba all of a sudden you know like i would expect these instruments are lined up in a straight line if you can see this here uh this is f sharp of course but this is g it's not f and and it's it's really a weird thing to see f where I would expect kind of E to be, even though it doesn't really coincide. This to me is more like B natural than C, but this is C natural. So this is when you go play this instrument, it really throws you for a loop unless you're, unless you're uh, used to it. So, okay. Um, now, there are two terms in, in Costa Rica that we use. One is marimbero, which is a marimba builder. And the other one is marimbista or marimbist of course, which is a marimba performer. And I thought I would put a picture, of course, of our dear Beverly Johnston here uh, to show a marimba uh, performer, uh, which is a marimbista in Costa Rica. Uh, these are a couple of builders. Um, you can see the keyboard here, again, lined up in a straight line. Uh, Miguel Torres built one of, one of these instruments in, in, at the university. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this for you so you can... Here is a six and a half octave marimba from Costa Rica. We refer to this instrument as marimba grande. And it's usually played by three or four people. So the register of this instrument goes from the top of the regular marimba, okay, all the way down to the G below middle C. And, and that's below as you can hear, the five see here. Octaves, so this sorry. is middle, I mean, a low C of the five octave marimba, this instrument goes a perfect fourth below that. And I just put some mallets in there to represent the ranges. So there's one bass player, one harmony player, which usually plays with three mallets, then a counter melody player, which plays with two, and a melody player, which plays with two. This instrument has drawers. As you can see down below, I left a couple of mallets in there so you could see. The little drawers hold the mallets actually when you finish playing you just stick them in there and then you're done it's actually pretty cool um so that's what it is that's a marimba marimba grande here we have a smaller instrument that we refer to in costa rica as marimba tenor tenor marimba and this one's actually a little bit bigger than a regular tenor a regular tenor is usually four or three and a half octaves this instrument is actually four and a half uh, this is a custom-made instrument by Oscar Violet in Costa Rica. And um, I, again, I put the mallets just so you can see the bass player, harmony player in the middle, and then melody player on the top. So uh, this instrument, along with the, the six and a half octave or the larger instrument, when put together in an L shape, we call that marimba escuadra. And that just refers to a full marimba ensemble. So you have three players on this instrument, you know, four players on this instrument, and then you have a really full sounding marimba ensemble. Keep. Okay. Now, a, a couple more short videos here. I'm going to show you very quickly how to replace the telilla or the little pig's gut. As you can see, this is very, very, very light. Actually, perhaps before I, I show you this, I'll just mention this. The sound of the traditional marimba is very different than the sound of the concert marimba. And that is due to a buzz that is created through this uh, thing that is showing on the video. Uh, this little layer of pig's gut, which is attached to the resonator through a little hole at the bottom of the resonator. And that creates the, the buzz that you hear. So I'll continue with the video. Okay. And what you need is just a little piece of that, some natural um, kind of rubber of sorts. It's, it, it's, this comes from a tree. You heat it up to put over the hole of the resonator. You also need a little tool like this to make sure that the, that the hole is, is round, you know? And, and free of debris. So here we go. Okay, so you heat, heat this up.
And then you put some of that over here, around, around the whole circumference of the belly button, as we call it. Okay. Then you ensure that that's smooth around, and that the hole is free of debris. And then you attach a little bit of the pig scud on it. And then eventually you cut it, but that's basically it. Okay, so that creates the buzz um, of the sound. Um, the mallets now, the mallets uh, that are used on the traditional marimba are made for, from a natural uh, latex of sorts, a natural rubber. Um, and uh, that is um, obtained from a tree that creates this sap. Um, once you extract the sap, then you lay it down and you make it, you make it um, um, you know, flat on a, on a surface. Once it dries, then you cut it in strips. Then you have now a little core um, that you use and you wrap the little strips of rubber around it until you come up with the final, you know, mallets, until the product, okay? Now, I'm going to talk because it's very coincidental, of course, that today is January 14th. And January 14th in Costa Rica, in the city of Santa Cruz, is a very special day. Um, Costa Rica is a, is a Catholic country, of course. And January 14th is the beginning of a celebration uh, for the patron of Santa Cruz, which is the Black Christ of Esquipulas. Um, this is, a, like I said, a, a Catholic um, tradition. You know, they, they, they um, have a big procession where they bring the Black Christ of Esquipulas into the city. And then there's a big, um, there's a big celebration. Um, so this, this piece, by the way, uh, sound, sounds, sounds a little like this. <laughs> Etc. Um, it, it's, it's a very, like I said, it's a very special special day. Um, the celebrations. There's there's also a very big tradition of uh, brass bands in Costa Rica. And January 14 celebrations kick off with a brass band in the middle of the park in Santa Cruz uh, performing uh, this kind of music. rhythm, by the way, is, is one of the traditional rhythms of Costa Rica. It's called Parrandera. Um, this celebration of January 14 involves several things culturally. One of them is, is this, guys, which we call the clowns, okay, los payasos. And every morning, there is a parade of this, uh, of this guys, which march down the street, playing to a brass band. Doing that kind of thing, it's it's just it's it's a celebration more than anything for the for the kids um, that love this these clowns. Oops. Then there's also a big tradition of bull riding in the city of Santa Cruz. This is uh, in the northern area of Costa Rica where there's a lot of cattle, and bull riding is actually a very big tradition over there. And of course, there's marimbas. 
Um, and in every single corner of town, there's going to be a marimba group performing. <laughs> Okay, um, there's a lot of people that play uh, in of all generations, you know, from little kids uh, to older people, uh, everybody participates. <laughs> The screaming that you hear, by the way, is very traditional also. Uh, people people um, have this particular scream that they do when they hear music. Oops. Okay, and there's a little bit of everything that you see when you're walking down the street in Santa Cruz around this area of the year. I thought that'd be fun for you guys to see also, you know. Um, and, and this goes on for three and a half days from morning until evening. So I, I, I won't play, you know, too many of these videos because I think they're going to be too long. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry to, to interrupt. Uh, uh, it, it, we have a, a few more minutes, so um, just to let you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, and, and I'm happy you know, to, to share this. Uh, with there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of really great players. Um, one of the things that uh, people do in, in this in this time is they they add this instrument, the guida, the metal metal guido. And so, if you don't know the tune. If you want to participate, you just grab a guida and play, and it's, it's just funny. That's all. So if you're not playing marimba, you just play guida. Um, and this, of course, we're all familiar with, you know, moving instruments, but you see this all the time in Santa Cruz during this time. Marimba's being moved from place to place. Um, now, um, there's a, a tradition, of course, of builders in Costa Rica, and now there's a new generation of builders, including Oscar Violet, who has made the, this instrument that we have at the University of Minnesota now, uh, which is this gorgeous, really a piece of art. Um, and he's also a very innovative uh, thinker, this young guy. Uh, if you see these instruments here, these are uh, small small marimbas that you can put on on, on a suspended cymbal stand, basically. Um, and then you just, they're very portable, uh, which which makes, uh, makes it very easy for people that want to gig around um, with them. Um, the education of the marimba in, in Costa Rica is, uh, they, is they start very young and um, a lot of these kids, I have a video uh, of this where, you know, where they can, they can't even reach the floor. So, they, have, they, have to use this. they have to use a little stool um, and the, the, the learning is done not through a music score, but it's oral uh, and visual. So the, the teacher will show. <laughs> so they, they, you know, like I said, they start very young. Um, and, um, um, oops. Um, they, this is the, the, the building basically where all this education takes place and you can walk in there at all, at all the time and listen to music. Um, there's kids, there's older people, of course, um, working on the instrument. Um, this is one of the iconic, uh, figures of Costa Rica's marimba. 
um, Ulpiano Duarte and his son, Gerardo Duarte, who have um, really created a lot of, you know, amazing, amazing things for the marimba. Um, I was on sabbatical doing transcription of some of this music, so I'm hoping in the next year or so, a lot of this music will be seeing the, the light and, and everybody can partake of it. Um, these are um, just, you know, experiences we've had before over there. Uh, where we where we went to share in playing with a with a group of young kids um, back in 2017, and this is I wanted to show you this because uh, this uh, this when you know and not know the keyboard. It sounds of course like regular music. So yeah, it's actually very funny um, when you don't know that keyboard and you're trying to play. Uh, this is a tune, by the way, that my students uh, know very well, and we were playing it in concert, but on a concert marimba. And when we were in Santa Cruz, they wanted to try their hand at playing on a on a traditional marimba, and and you saw of course the results there. Uh, so there is uh, of course a lot. Um, a lot more than just uh, traditional music played. Uh, composers today are writing uh, in the style of traditional music, but for a more contemporary, with a more contemporary feel. That gives you an example of that. Um, and there's, of course, a more um, a more contemporary sound, even. the end of uh of my presentation let me oh. stop sharing here there we go okay okay thank you so much uh, that was uh that was fantastic <laughs> um uh, so i think the best thing to do is um at this point um if people have questions to put them in the chat and we won't deal with them now but maybe at the end of the session we can go through different questions to the different uh, panelists so thank you so much fernando that was uh, just incredible yeah. so we have uh, sk kakraba here who's uh, tuning in from los angeles but he's originally from ghana and uh, I'll read a little bit about SK. I found uh, information about him on Wikipedia. So, um, so here you go. SK Kakaraba is a Ghanaian musician and performer of the country's traditional music. He makes and performs Gilles, Gilles a, a xylophone containing 14 suspended wooden slats stretched over calabash gourds containing resonators. He was taught to build the instruments using a rare wood known by the lobi as Nura. Kakraba explained, it's a very hard process because you have to get the wood from five different places only found in Ghana's forests. The trees fall on their own and when they do, you cut them, dry the wood and lay the keys. Um, LA Weekly ha has referred to uh, Kakraba as the world's greatest xylophone player and he has toured worldwide playing the Gilles. Kakraba grew up in um, Saru, a small village in Ghana where the jil is held in great respect by the Lobi tribe. It is played at funerals to help the souls of the dead reach the afterlife and is a primary instrument of other northern Ghana cultures like the Sisala and Dagara. 
Kakraba's parents also played the jil, as did other relatives, including his uncle Kakraba Lobi. And uh, Fernando made me aware of Kakraba Lobi. And this is how my research happened to find uh, SK. Um, and uh, Kakraba Lobi uh, is considered by many to be among the instrument's greatest practitioners. In 97, uh, SK moved to Accra and began busking and soon joined the group Hewale Sounds. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, who aim to preserve and, uh, thank you, familiarize the traditional music of Ghana. Kakraba has taught the Gil at the University of Ghana's International Center for African Music and Dance, and he's uh, currently living in Highland Park, uh, Los Angeles. Um, and I think you've been there since 2012. So welcome, SK. I hope you can demonstrate uh, the sound of your beautiful instrument and tell us a few things afterwards. Okay. Thank you.
Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, SK. I mean, this is really incredible. Um, the, the first time um, I met you was through Zoom, uh, which was uh, the beginning of September, and we had a little chat about your instrument. So I would, I, I, I would love to uh, share uh, some of the, um, first, some of the experience you had in Ghana, um, as, as uh, we, that I mentioned before, your uncle is um, uh, Kakraba Lobi, who's actually quite well known even in, uh, in our world as uh, a, an, an amazing player too, and uh, also a great teacher of the instrument. Uh, so ca can you uh, t walk us through what it's like to be in Ghana playing the instrument and how did you start learning the instrument? Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, already you introduced me. I was born in a small community called Saru. And I began uh, playing the instrument when I was a little boy. Um, I learned from the elders. And I listened to different xylophone players and uh, when I hear them play, I grab the beaters, try to play the same thing. And, and if I play something wrong, my uncle or my family, they correct me the right thing to do. And so that's how I grew up and I learned all the repertoires um, from the elders. Um, the Jill. This instrument is called Jil in my native language and uh, English called it xylophone. Um, the Jil is made up of uh, a very dense wood called Nira in my language. And I think English might call it rose wood. I think so. It's very dense wood, um, and the keys are strung across the frame. Underneath there are gods that has holes in the gods, and there are, and then the stretch with the silk walls of spider egg sacs, and the buzzes you are hearing is coming from the spider egg sacs. In my uh, <coughs> my uh, community, the lobby believe that the, the buzzes come from the buzzes balances the bodies of humans and animals. It, it balances water in the bodies of humans and animals. Um, um, and and SK, the SK, sorry to interrupt you. Can you yeah. take the mic just a little further away from your mouth? I, I think. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Or oh, maybe a little closer, but just yeah. <laughs> Can you hear okay. me more? <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So the uh, the jewel is used for all kinds of celebrations in Ghana, from wedding and funeral to dances and everyday recreation. Um, the, and it's used for uh, playing at funerals and actually the instrument is very, uh, it is an instrument that when somebody passes away, it is what we use to celebrate the life of the deceased. And uh, you heard me play a piece, and that piece is called uh, Dark uh, Gomper. And it's a funeral piece, it's a dirge. We have uh, two types of xylophones in my community, uh, in my tribe. This is the kojil. The kojil is what we use for the funerals, and we have the bojil which is used for uh, funerals, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, festivals, festivals. And um, the koju 
and like i was saying the piece that i played first was uh is a dutch music and it is normally accompanied by a drum and a bell mm. and the bell um is given the timing the xylophone is the lead instrument the drum uh accompany and um the dancers will and will line up and dance in front so when somebody passes away the instrument is actually we use the instrument to start well sometimes in my community when someone passed away you don't really uh you can't tell because people are mourning but you can't tell actually if the person is passed away or not until you hear the instrument once you hear the instrument playing that's that it confirms that the person actually passed away mm. and so and then you hear once you hear the the warming up the the of on the xylophone then you realize the person passed away so the um and then when you hear the bell and the drum and the funeral began from there and so the instrument is really is is very important at our funerals in Ghana the koji and the boji there are two two accompany like um one is leading and one is uh is is backing and uh, with the bell and and it has a dead key that you can't play that that dead key and because if you do it means that <laughs> you don't really know <laughs> what you are doing so that dead key is there <laughs> uh yeah you don't play that one and so and when we have festivals and those instruments are used in playing uh are used at the festivals and so there's the two different types of xylophones uh jills we have in my community um uh, uh, SK, you had mentioned that, uh, to me uh, way back when that uh, the instrument is played indoors uh, because I've, I've usually seen, you know, videos of the instrument outdoors, but you mentioned that sometimes it's played indoors too? Yeah, th those days um, it's not allowed to play outside because if you play outside, it means that somebody, they think, they assume pe somebody passed away. So it is always played in a in a house mm. where uh if you want to rehearse or uh play you you it is only in the house you play but um <laughs> it is uh nowadays it is taken outside you can play anywhere mm. uh actually this the instrument was uh brought out to the international world by my uncle because um, when he started his musical career in Accra and, and working with Professor Nkatia in the University of Ghana and uh, Prof has and they always go out to go uh, do uh, presentations and uh, performances in, in America and in different different countries so mm -hmm. that's how the right. instrument actually was brought to the international well. Mm. Um, so. Can you, t can you, th th this is really great information. I'd like to know your life in Los Angeles now. And um, are you teaching uh, the Gilles? I, you had mentioned the other day that you had a student who was in New Mexico. And how does anybody acquire this beautiful instrument? Uh, are they, ma are you making them in um, uh, North America? Or uh, do you have to get one from Africa? I could do it here um, if I have the materials right. Uh, I can do it here, but uh, if I don't have the materials, so I, I my work is still in Ghana because my brother is working on that, and if I need instrument, he ship them. So um, he he's there. So uh, mm. if I uh, so it's still me, you know. Um, yeah, I live here. Moving here, I had. Uh, you know, I met this uh, guy, a label, a rec record label guy in Ghana years back when he was uh, 
Torin. Uh, he was in Ghana and at the University of Ghana we met there. I performed and he saw me. So we became very good friends and um, when I moved here, so I met him. His name is Brian Sinkovis and he has a label called uh, awesome, awesome Tale from Africa and he decided I could do a record on the label. So mm -hmm. I did a one and so and then I did another one for Dr Drag City in Illinois. And um I do teachings here. Uh Carl Art bring me in and out to uh come and teach and uh, you know and UCLA sometimes too. Mm -hmm. So Fantastic. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, good for you. Um, yeah, this is how what I'm doing here in LA. And, yeah. and and performances, you know, I tour, I tour to, I perform in different states, and I've toured uh, Europe performing. You know, mm -hmm. I've done a lot of shows moving here. Uh, yeah, but it's very interesting because when he was uh, talking about uh, the instrument, I saw that they were talking about the the way the the spider uh, X sax uh, has been stretched on the. The, uh, this uh, the instrument, and I thought that is very interesting. It's very it kind of it's the same as the way we does it because the the god we put the the glue is is a glue sub uh, and then you you put it around the holes, and then you uh, paste the the you okay. Sometimes you put a, a fire a, what you call a lighter around it the hole to make it hot and then the, the glue can hold so then you paste the you paste the spider uh, uh sacks there and to create the bars that was kind of very interesting yeah. part that I, I i saw over there and um yeah it's interesting how it was kept uh, from you know the african tradition uh, and is still a part of uh, costa rican tradition too yeah and the jew and and then we 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 develop and uh, making a new like uh, modernizing it by uh, making a G pentatonic and C pentatonic which I know my family or back at home my people wouldn't uh, it will be hard for them because the sound is not going to be the same yeah uh, and, and and so we make C pentatonic and G pentatonic to be able to play with uh, different instruments yeah I, I have a band here that I, I perform with sometimes when people want the whole band I bring them we go perform if they solo they bring me I go play so so I use when I'm playing with the the band I use the G pentatonic or the C pentatonic and the G pentatonic is uh, I you know <laughs> Is uh, when we are making the instrument right now. The Spider X sax is very difficult to find them here in LA, and 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 even in Accra, where where I'm not in the northern part of because the instrument is actually from the northern part of Ghana, and I I don't live there. I live in Accra for a while. Uh, 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 when I move from Accra, uh, my hometown to Accra. So it's hard to find the spider egg sacs in the cities. So mm. uh, we found the UPS, the UPS uh, envelope. The envelopes, there's some envelope that is come. It comes from the uh, U UPS. It's very. Uh, we take it off the thicker part off and make it a light one, and it sounds the same as the spider. X sax. That's what we use. I, uh, I know what you, it's it's almost like an onion skin. You know, it's very uh, thin paper. Yes, that, exactly. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So yeah. at uh, in in the beginning, um, mod, uh, those days we use uh, uh, the antelope, the antelope skin, to uh, to tie the keys on the frames. Uh, because we believe that the antelope brought the xylophone for for our people. Because the hunter went to the f uh, bush for hunting, and it found the antelope. He wanted to shoot the antelope, and the antelope 
uh, uh, so don't shoot me. I have something special for you. <laughs> and and so it didn't shoot. And so it got the instrument and brought it home. So that is how we discovered the instrument, mm -hmm. uh, Jill. <coughs> Great. Uh, SK, we're, we're, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Uh, as I think with all of you, we could do like a two hour presentation with each of you, but mm. I'm afraid we're going to have to move on here. And, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing your incredible musicality uh, as a performer, but also the information you gave us about your, your lovely instrument. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you too. Yeah. For having me. Yeah. Um, so uh, up next is um, uh, Lester Godinez, who uh, Fernando Meza had mentioned to me. Um, uh, and I had also uh, seen uh, Lester's uh, group perform uh, at the uh, first concert uh, of Fernando's festival in 2010. And I love the sound of the instrument. So I'll just give a little bit of a... Uh, a bio, uh, short bio of Lester, and then he has a PowerPoint presentation uh, about the history of the marimba. And again, he has to do it within like 25 minutes. So uh, we'll just be scraping the surface, I'm sure. But thank you, Lester, for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, okay, uh, so actually, SK, I'll mute you. Okay. Uh, so uh, he, uh, Lester holds a master's degree in public administration from the INAP Public Admis Administration Institute, also two degrees in music, Bachelor of Music uh, from uh, the University of Guatemala in 20 2007 and a Bachelor of Music from the University of San Carlos de Guatemala in 2008. In addition to the title of Professor of High Music in uh, High School in Music, he graduated uh, from the University University of uh, Val de Guatemala in 2004. He has worked in different fields of culture and music, including research, composition, interpretation, teaching, production, arrangement, and musical direction. Uh, he's also uh, well-versed in uh, jazz music, and he has, uh, as far as I know, uh, well, he has written a book about the history of the marimba, um, and Fernando told me about this, but I do believe that the book is only in Spanish or there are very few copies in English because I'd love to get my hands on that book. <laughs> so anyways, uh, uh, I'd like to welcome Lester. I'm not seeing you on my uh, pictures here, but uh, please come forward. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, Beverly your invitations. I, I, for this uh, Zoom, I'm going to give a presentation more uh, than a, lecture, a lecture than a presentation specifically, but in a hurry. <laughs> okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to share the. The marimba in America. It's okay. Okay, the marimba in America. There is my email for any people who want to write me. All the information. Uh, is from the from my book La Marimba, a historical, organological, and cultural study. Sorry in Spanish, but soon translated into English. General intro. Let's review the organological principles of the marimba. The marimba the balafon or jill and the roneatec and similars belongs to the tablet grouping concept. So here we have tablets, but this way they don't defi define anything. Must be in succession by size or by sound. Now, 
what is then the oldest reference of the concept of the graphene tablets. The oldest reference is the Dan Da, the lithophones of Vietnam, Vietnam, Southeast Asian, are the oldest reference of the concept of graphene tablets dating between 3,500 and 5,000 years. Now the question is, how did the marimba appear in America, especially the captaincy general of the kingdom of Guatemala? From Guatemala, from Soconusco, Chiapas, uh, to Costa Rica. We start from the premise that the grouping concept of tablets has had a great diffusion in Southeast for centuries after the Vietnam lithophones. So let's follow the geographical road of that concept around the world. First, the Indonesians carry the concept from Southeast Asia across the Indian Sea to Madagascar. From Madagascar, the concept jumps to Mozambique and the Eastern coast of Africa. The concept moves by rivers to the Congo and the South Sahara region or Guinea region. The concept is taken to Egypt, Mesopotamia and Europe, the xylophone route. The concept is carried by slaves to America it, 16th century. I'm talking about the concept, not a, any specific instrument, just the concept. I want to make it clear for those who have believed that the marimba came directly for Af from Africa. That is, was impossible for African slaves to bring musical instruments when they were barely dressed. They, on the contrary, brought all their cultural values on their mind. In 1908, Guatemalan Hurtado brothers introduced the marimba in the USA the industrial marimba is created. In 1958, the industrial marimba was introduced to Japan by Reverend Lawrence Lacour with the marimba quartet, the Lacour's mission group. And we close around the world the, the road of uh, the concept of a group in tablets. The first mention, mention of the marimba in America documented, of course. The historian Domingo Juarros quotes Diego Felix de Carranza y Cordova, the priest of Jutiapa who makes an account of the parade held on the eighth day of prayer for the inauguration of the primate cathedral of Santiago de los Caballeros, Guatemala, on the 13th of November, 1680, especially. The last night of the celebration in the square was greater. Troop of boxes, drums, bugles, trumpets, marimbas, and all the instruments used by the Indians went ahead. They went 
in great numbers with rich dresses and galas as they are used to in their dances. The instrument referred to is the marimba, the tecomates or gourd marimba. Note that the marimba was already identified with the indigenous people. Here is the Cathedral of San Jose, 18th century and 20th century. So when we talk about the marimba, the Guatemalan marimba, we are really talking about three instruments. Marimba de tecomates or gourd marimba, marimba sencilla or diatonic marimba, and marimba double or chromatic marimba. All this is in part of this information you can read on the book, Marimbas of Guatemala, written by Vaida Chenowet. Chichicastenango city in Guatemala is the hometown of the marimba de Tecomates. Researcher, Dr. Sigfredo Cabrera Rajo, University of Barcelona, wrote on December 15, 5027, Adelantado Pedro de Alvarado, Captain General and, and Governor of the Guatemalan provinces, brought the first African af, as forced African labor in Chichicastenango and the province of Guatemala with the secretary Francisco de los Cobos and Dr. Beltrán de la Cueva, they former, formed a partnership to export 600 slaves from Sevilla, Spain, to exploit the mines of Chichicastenango and regions of the province of Guatemala. The coexistence between the indigenous people of Chichicastenango and the African slaves since 1527 led to the emergence of the marimba de Tecomates first instrument recognized as marimba in the American continent. The characteristics 21 to 25 keys order in the diatonic system due to the European influence. Tecomates or gourd resonators has no legs, can be carried, played by, played by one person as the uh, antecessors with four or five mallets has an arched, arched stick. Arises in Guatemala between 1527 and 1680. Then Marimba Sencilla or simple marimba developed in Santiago de los Caballeros de Guatemala by priest Juan Joseph de Padilla, 18th century. Has 42 to 45 keys diatonic system keyboard. Wooden boxes as resonators instead of the comates resonators. First and unique collective instrument of the world, three to five players in the same instrument. A new frame with four legs, that's important. Thanks to this, the first instrument played standing up, other similars 
instruments in Asia and Africa are still played on the ground. Double or chromatic marimba, 1894. Sebastian Hurtado, seated at right, developed a, a chromatic keyboard with his own ideas and those of the teacher, Julian Paniagua, back in the portrait. Below, the two Guatemalan chromatic marimba keyboards left the sharps, right diatonic keys. This is this instrument for showing. Maestro Sebastián Hurtado showing his first chromatic marimba with a double keyboard, 1894. We can appreciate the black wax rings and his skin superimposed under the resonator mentioned by uh, Fernando and SK. The photograph, the picture from 1896 shows a historical celebration of the Hurtado family at the yard of their home factory in which for the first time they simultaneously perform on several chromatic marimbas in a collective mold that characterizes the marimbas of Mesoamerica. Note at the right how early the Guatemalan marimbas already had large resonators for the bases, a wake aspect of the first industrial marimbas. The Hurtado Brothers Royal Marimba Band of Guatemala who introduced the marimba to the United States in 1908 with the final mode of playing the marimba in Guatemala and other countries as explained uh, by Fernando in other countries in Central America with two instruments, tenor marimba at left and large marimba on right. The marimba in other countries, I will not mention Costa Rica because Fernando talking about that. Marimba de Arco Nicaragüense from Nicaragua developed from the Guatemalan marimba de Tecomates, Cuajichote or Ñambar wood keyboard. Cedar cylinder resonators. Modernly developed from the marimba of the Comates. Here the maestro Elias Palacios, Nicaraguan marimbist. Marimba de Chonta from Ecuador and Colombia. Originally suspended from the houses of the tropics. Chonta wood keyboard, a kind of palm. Guadua pipe resonators, a kind of American bamboo. Below with adapted legs and local percussion instruments. The marimba does not currently exist on this continent, only this is illustration. No doc documentary references. In Peru, the marimba does not currently too exist on this continent, only this illustration. Chromatic marimba from Chiapas, developed in 1896 by Corazón de Jesús Borras. 
Its keyboard is made of hormiguillo wood, the same as Cristobal uh, Fernando. Wooden boxes, resonators in cedar wood, as in Guatemala, simply uh, single marimba or uh, diatonic marimba. The piano like keyboard layout. This is the unique in Mesoamerica that has this design. World marimba development. Viejos Hurtado, the old Hurtado, members of the most important family in the development of the marimba in the world. The Hurtado Brothers Royal Marimba Band, the young Hurtado, performed in 1908 at the Pan American Expo in Buffalo, New York, where Maestro John Calhoun Digan was able to appreciate the great Guatemalan marimba. He was impressed and asked the teachers, the maestros, uh, questions. The Hurtado teachers or maestros marimbistas indicated the operation of the instrument. Master Digan admired and appreciated the virtuosity of the Maestros Hurtado. 1908. Recognitions. This is a, a, a recognition for me, uh, but mentioned the Hurtado brothers. We can read in recognition of uh, Lester Godinez and the Marimba Nacional de Concierto commemorating the 100th anniversary of the introduction of the chromatic marimba to the United States and the international community by the Hurtado Brothers Royal Marimba in 1908. Uh, we perform in Berkeley Performance Center in Boston at uh, June 24 to uh, 2008. Creators of the industrial marimba, Sebastian Hurtado and their family, of course, contributed the know-how. John Calcundigan, creator of the industrial marimba in 1910, two years after uh, that meeting of uh, uh, Maestro Digan and Hurtado family. They pat uh, uh, Maestro Digan patented his instrument uh, with the name of Nabimba, the first industrial marimba created in 1910 in the USA by John Calhoun Digan, taking ideas from Sebastian Hurtado, Guatemalan marimba. In the first model, it has, we can, no, this is, in the first model, uh, Maestro Digan keep the, uh, the wax rings and the, the skin, the skin from the Guatemalan marimba. Contemporary development of the Guatemalan marimba. Celso Hurtado, virtuous and innovative soloist of the marimba, son of Maestro Sebastian Hurtado. First solo marimbis to perform at Carnegie Hall, April 7, 1946. In that concert, he performed works by Paganini, Saint-Saëns, 
Brahms, Albenis, De Falla. Here is the hand program of that uh, ephemerides. Jorge Sarmientos, composer of the Marimba Concerto in 1957, dedicated to Marim Marimbis Vaida Chenovet, who premiered the concert. In a photo performed by Keiko Abe with Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra under the direction of the composer. Sorry, he was dead. Below, Maestro Sarmientos conduct, conducting in Venezuela. I'm going to finish. Joaquin Orellana, Guatemalan contemporary con composer, creator, inventor, innovator. He has created more than 20 sound artifacts based on the marimba. The name is uh, Sinusoidum, the name of this instrument to play contemporary music. Here we can see two more uh, instruments or artifact, Cycloim up and uh, Master Orellana activating his Imbaluna. Joaquin Orellana's Symphony from the Third World for Guatemalan Marimba, Orellana's Sound Artifacts, Mixture, Church, and Symphony Orchestra. World premiere, Athens, July 2017. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, Lester. This is uh, this is really incredible information. Some of which I had no idea about, uh, and uh, it was always a question in my mind about uh, the uh, the origins of the marimba, and uh, that uh, indeed uh, there's it's from Asia and then went over to Africa. Is that correct? Sure. Um, as uh, SK have told, uh, he mentioned the uh, pentatonic keyboard, and uh, that uh, shows the ascendant from uh, or descendant from uh, uh, Asia. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, and, and I, I apologize because I, I know there's so much more information and you had emailed me saying, you know, okay. not enough time, but really we got so much information here from you and um, uh, thank you so much. Um, so you. now we're on to, uh, uh, if you could also, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, Stop sharing your screen. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We we love sharing. We're all into sharing, but uh, but I have to move on because uh, last but not least is um, uh, w William Morse, who I've known for many years. In fact, the first time William and I uh, met uh, personally was uh, when I was visiting New York City for a studio session, and uh, I called uh, Bill up and I said, "Can can I get together with you and chat about the marimba?" <laughs> so <laughs> that was back in 1995. So I'll just uh, read a short uh, uh, section of uh, Bill's bio, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, uh, I, I can cut to the chase on that. OK. OK, fine. So uh, take it away, Bill. <laughs> Thank you for right. joining. To, just to give you a, the Cliff Notes version of my bio, uh, I received a Bachelor of Music and a Master of Music from the University of Michigan in the first class with Charles Owen when he started teaching at Michigan. Uh, I moved to New York City where I was active as a freelance percussionist, solo marimbist, any number of things for 22 years. Then I took a position at the University of Illinois, where I've also been for 
I think 23 years now. Um, and I've most of that time I've focused on marimba. I've commissioned following the influence of Keiko Abe, I started commissioning American composers to write for the marimba. So I'm up to 112 pieces now that I've commissioned. That's the basic summary. So Beverly asked me to give you some of the North American history of the marimba. Lester has covered some of the basics already, although interestingly, we disagree on a few small items here and there. <laughs> um, let's, you know, I can't, how do I get rid of this? thing at the top anyone know how I get rid if, of it? if if Tim Roth is there maybe he can help uh, guide you through this let's try or, or Tyler there. Cunningham sorry I'm okay. not sure what program you're using but there should be well, a... the, what, what I'm the problem I'm having how do I get rid of the black band from zoom uh I'm not sure if you go to more options nope, I got it okay, it's okay. Awesome. got it now okay, okay we're good all right so, uh, you heard about the Hurtado Brothers Marimba Band. There's another photo. This one, for some reason, is plus or minus the double bass. Uh, the place that we start is with J.C. Deegan and Ulysses G. Leedy, who were both professional musicians. Deegan was a clarinetist. Leedy was a percussionist. By <laughs> the late 1890s, Deegan began in 1880. Leedy began in the late 1890s. Um, Deegan had been in the U.S. Navy, stationed in Britain. He heard Helmholtz lecture on acoustics. Uh, and from his theater work in St. Louis, he was very dissatisfied with the intonation of the glockenspiels that they were, he was having to play clarinet with. So he set out to produce a, a more in tune glockenspiel. Uh, then he adapted the four-row xylophone by adding resonators and a frame. Um, but basically by 1898, both Deegan had established a company in Chicago, and Leedy had established Leedy Drum Company in Indianapolis. Um, the influence from the Hurtado Brothers Band was tremendous. In 1901, they were actually scheduled to come to the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, but that was the occasion when President McKinley was assassinated, and that Oops. sort of put a crimp in things, so they went back without performing. In 1908, they came to White City Summer Resort in Louisiana, and they were such a tremendous success that the band went on tours of the United States, and then in 1910, tours of Europe. Agreed, Deegan picked up some influences at that point, and by, although Deegan was already producing a variety of instruments, none of them were giving model numbers, given model numbers until 1910. In 1910, the J.C. Deegan Company offered a wide range of instruments, marimba xylophones from two octaves to six octaves in size. Here you can see a Deegan marimba xylophone, which is a, I forget how large this one is. Oops, sorry, moved ahead. Um, at any rate, sorry, I want to go back to that one. How do I go back? Let's try this. This is problematic. All right, we won't go back. At any rate, um, the early instruments that Deegan made, the marimba, the former marimba, which I would show you but can't, uh, is notable because the bars are very widely spaced. There are two bar posts between each pair, each bar, each pair of bars. So there's a good half inch of space between all the bars. That's one of the more notable things. Um, that gradually went away to a single bar post idea. This is a photograph of an actual in the bimba. Uh, and this was the model that had the buzz and the resonators after the Guatemalan idea. By night, he also offered, nope, nope, how do I? All right, he also offered what he called the marimba phone, which is a marimba with arced bars and the idea is that it can be bowed with a double bass bow. In order to make that possible, the frame is hinged, and you can rotate the plane of the bars from horizontal to vertical, which makes the, the access to the, the concave curve to the end of the bars for the bow to sit in. Here we go. Go back to this. You can see my cursor is working. It's not. You can see in the on the right-hand side in the middle, there's an overhead shot of the of the 
marimba xylophone. Notice that huge space between the bars that made it less, less attractive to play from our point of view. All right. Again, this is the Deegan marimba phone. 1912, Deegan moved into a new building in the Ravenswood part of Chicago. This is the famous Deegan Tower, clock tower on that building. Young Claire Musser, Claire Moore Musser, born in 1901. Uh, when he was a teenager, he, he heard Teddy Brown playing with Earl Fuller's Rector, Rector Novelty Orchestra in the late 19-teens and was inspired to, to take up the xylophone. Also important in the year, specifically the year 1917, before this point, all the instruments that Deegan offered were available in either high pitch or low pitch. Low pitch was A445, high pitch was A461. Any instrument you bought from Deegan, you specified which pitch you wanted it to be at. You can imagine from a manufacturing standpoint, this was a huge pain to, <laughs> to have to make this available. So Deegan led a campaign to adopt A440 as standard pitch, and in 1917, the American Federation of Musicians accepted that as the standard. For some reason, there is a lot of misinformation. You'll see a lot of sources that mention 1910 as the year, but it's 1917. I have a, tuning, a Deegan tuning fork where it's stamped right on the tuning fork, AF of M adopted in 1917. Um, at that point, simplified things tremendously. Next. Here's a photograph of a young Claire Musser in 1921 with his Deegan Marimba xylophone. He was on a tour with a group called the Serenaders. Deegan began to, or Musser began to experiment with modifications. Oh, I'm skipping over something else. Which is 1915, very important year. Uh, there was a Pan American, or sorry, Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. And the Hurtado Brothers Royal Marimba Band, the Ideal Marimba Band, the Blue and White Marimba Band all performed at various pavilions and again made a huge success. They immediately started recording for multiple record labels, including Columbia, Victor, Brunswick, and others. So Musser was experimenting with coming up with a few different ideas. This was one single horn instrument that he developed and was built by Deegan. Then following that, in 1924 and 25, he developed this marimba celeste, which is a double horn instrument. It has a five octave marimba xylophone. Above that, there's a single keyboard two octave vibra harp where the, where the bars are anodized silver and black, so you can tell the difference between the naturals and the accidentals. They're in a single row, though. Um, it had electric pickups that ran into two, two 12 inch speaker, 10 inch speakers in the horns to amplify the bass. This may be the reason, as Lester mentioned, that the bass resonators were probably not large enough to really give enough sound. But anyway, in 1927, Deegan produced this instrument for Musser, and for the next four years, he toured the U.S. and Europe performing violin concerti of. Bach, Chopin, Mendelssohn, and Paganini with orchestras. While he was in the midst of that, he was he had just performed with sorry, got ahead of myself, just performed with the Chicago Symphony, overheard the organizers discussing the upcoming Century of Progress exhibition that was going to happen in mm -hmm. 1933, made the suggestion to really make it special, he would put together a 100-piece marimba orchestra to play on that occasion. Another instrument, unusual instrument, this is Harry Brewer. Had Deegan make him a combined marimba vibraphone instrument that he used for several years in New York until he decided it was too much trouble to move. <laughs> so he traded it back into Deegan for individual instruments. This is the poster for the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, subtitled Century of Progress. For that, event, Muster put together a 100-piece marimba orchestra. Come on. Here they are on the steps of the pavilion. Mm -hmm. You can see that he designed a custom marimba called the Century of Progress Marimba for each individual player. They had to buy their own marimba. 
Um, the marimbas had this diamond plaque on the front that was engraved with their name, and each instrument was built to a custom height for the players, so on and so forth. Here's a picture from a week later. This is at the House of David in Benton Harbor, Michigan, slightly smaller unit, the same Century Progress marimbas. Interestingly enough, here's a photograph of George Hamilton Green with his personalized Century of Progress marimba. There seems to be, uh, it's unclear whether George Hamilton Green actually performed with the Century of Progress Orchestra. There doesn't seem to be any documentation proving that he did, but it might have just been a publicity angle to try and get him to switch from Leedy to Deegan to offer him that marimba. This is what the actual color was of those marimbas. Century Progress. It was offered in two sizes, a three and a half and a four and a half octave version. The four and a half went up an extra half octave to an F. This is important to note. We'll come back to there is one, among many of the players, significant players in the Century of Progress Orchestra was a young woman named Ruth Stuber. And she owned this type of marimba, a three and a half octave marimba. That will come back in a moment. In 1935, Musser decided he would organize the International Marimba Symphony Orchestra. It'd be 100 players, 50 men and 50 women, and they would tour Europe and come back to play in New York. The idea, the concept, was in 1935 they were going, it was going to be the 25th Jubilee of the coronation of King George in Britain. And so the plan was to go over to play for that occasion. So for that tour, Deegan designed this marimba, now colloquially known as the King George Marimba. It was available in four octave versions and also a bass marimba. It's the King George bass marimba. Um, at this point in time, they were using straight resonators, so the marimba, bass marimba had to be significantly taller. So there's a bench that the player stands on in order to manage that. Um, as it turned out, they were not able to play in Britain. They, oh, sorry. They organized. They were they rehearsed separately in different regions of the country. They, they got together. Um, didn't write this down. They got together at a resort. I think it's White Springs Resort um, to rehearse. Then they went by ship to get to Britain. Fortunately, there was a disagreement between the British Musicians Union and the American Musicians Union. Uh, the Americans had refused to allow a British, popular British band to play in New York uh, just prior to this. And so by the time they got to Britain, the British Musicians Union refused to allow them to play in Britain. So the International Marimba, Marimba Symphony Orchestra gave a concert from the boat to the dock. <laughs> and that was the extent of their performances in Britain. They went on to play in Paris and Brussels some other capitals, and then they came back to Carnegie Hall, 1935. This is the program for their Carnegie Hall shot. These are all mostly orchestra works that Musser had arranged for five parts. So every version of his marimba orchestras was of some multiple of five, either 15 or 25 or so on and so forth. Interestingly enough, although there were 100 players and 101 Marimbas on the tour, the extra one was a spare for parts in case of repairs. By the time they, they got to New York, sorry, got ahead of myself. There they are. This is in Carnegie Hall, 1935. If you count carefully, there are about 75 players on stage. At no point in the entire tour do they have a stage large enough to put all 100 players on there. So they played in various rotation and assignments. There, I skipped over it. All right, next really significant thing at this point is in 1940. This is the Orchestrette Classique in the Chamber Music Hall at Carnegie, which is now, I thought it was a different hall than the, than the recital hall or the main hall, but Carnegie says it's now called Weill Recital Hall, so it must be the recital hall. If you look over on the right side playing timpani, that's Ruth Stuber. She had studied uh, with Musser when she... She had graduated from Northwestern as a violin major in 1932. She took up a marimba just in time 
to play in the Century of Progress Orchestra in 1933. She moved to New York, studied with George Hamilton Green, um, and Philippe Petridas, Philippe Petridas, the conductor of this orchestra. She had formed the orchestra in order to give herself a place to conduct, since there were not too many openings with established symphonies for female conductors at that point in time. So she put together this all-women's orchestra. On occasion, they had a few men playing as ringers when necessary, but on this occasion, it looks like they held true to their motto. Um, and she wanted to feature the principal players. So, she, so Petridas commissioned Paul Creston to write his concerto for Ruth Stuber, Stuber later married name is Stuber Jean. All right, this is Salvi Cavicio, 1940, in Boston. A marimbas that I hadn't heard much about. He was one, the first one to start teaching in an American institution. He, he taught marimba at the New England Conservatory of Music starting in the 1930s through the 1950s, and one of his students was Vic Firth. You will also notice the way he's holding his four mallets. This is, by the way, the marimba is a Deegan imperial of that period. This grip is known as the stone grip. This is the way that George Lawrence Stone held the mallets with the last outside mallet between the, the little finger and the ring finger. So Caviccio plays this way. Uh, Mike Minieri, the vibist, plays with this grip, and his student Lalo, uh, Laura Friedman, uses this sort of a grip. So you may encounter that in a few places. <clears throat> Among Muster's students were a few people who went on to fame on their own. Burton Lynn Jackson was one of them. Muster was, began teaching at Northwestern University in 1942 to 1952 among his students. Burton Jackson, Doris Stockton. In 1945, Doris Stockton gave a town hall recital in New York. Salsa Hurtado, as Lester mentioned, um, 1947 gave his Carnegie Hall concert with a marimba of his own design shown here program which you saw already. Skipping over that. By 1948, Musser had decided to leave the Deegan Company. Um, at that point in time, in 1946 or so, the grandson of John Calhoun Deegan was running the company, and apparently there were a couple employees who, who when they returned from World War II, Deegan didn't give them their jobs back. And this, this was upsetting enough that it seemed to have caused Musser to decide to quit the company and form his own. So in 1948, he announced the Musser Company, and this was his line of marimbas. The most famous one is the Canterbury on the left side there, which you'll notice has this sort of large bulbous units on the two end pieces. It also has another feature. Here's an actual marimba. It has three rows of resonators. <laughs> the second row is completely fake. It's just there for visual. <laughs> and the third row is the usual natural one that doesn't arc down so, more, so far. Okay. The Canterbury was apparently available in your choice of finishes. I've seen versions. Most of them are white, but I've also seen a black one um, that Jack Connor was using for a while. This is a Canterbury bass marimba. Again, you can see the increased height and the need for a platform. Where are we now? Um, so also in 1947 is when Jack Connor commissioned Darius Mio to write the concerto for marimba and vibraphone, and then premiered that in 1949 with the St. Louis Symphony, where he had been working as a percussionist. Within a year or so, he quit the St. Louis Symphony to go off and play marimba for, for Xavier Cugat which is where I saw the black version of the Canterbury marimba. Uh, yes. Jose Betancourt. Big part? Jose Betancourt in uh, the Javier Cugat Orchestra. Ah, yes, right, thank you. This is Lacour, the, the Lacour family um, marimba quartet I, that Leslie had mentioned. The two, uh, Lawrence and Mildred, were both members of the International Marimba Symphony Orchestra and married shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. and then began a series of missionary 
tours through Japan. They played, at least on one of these tours, they played at 130 different cities in Japan. I'm not sure that they actually took these, these four King George marimbas on all those occasions. I've seen some other photos where they're playing uh, more standard-looking muster-type instruments rather than the King George's. But nevertheless, this is where a young Keiko Abe first heard the industrial marimba right. that inspired her. Mm -hmm. Among, also among Muster students was a group of Northwestern women who were known as the Marimba Coeds, And that was a group that went for at least 10 years with various personnel. Of particular note, first of all, you can see that the Marimba on the left is, again, is the Canterbury model. The Marimba next to it is the King George. This one in the middle is the one that raises an eyebrow. This is uh, Vera Lynn McN McNary Daylin is the player. She was uh, apparently inspired enough to ask for a special marimba to be made. It's made with bird's eye maple bars so that they're blonde in order to match her hair color. <laughs> this is another group. This is an Indiana uh, mallet ensemble. They're all playing muscle marimbas. You can see also a Canterbury marimba in the center. I draw your attention to the young man who's playing the high end of the Muster Canterbury. Any guesses on who that is? It's a very young Gary Burton. <laughs> oh, too far. All right. In 1956, another student of Claire Muster's, Gordon Peters, was at the Eastman School, and he formed the Marimba Masters, which is in their first incarnation. You can see this group, a few names that you might recognize. James Dotson is the Eastman student who asked his colleague James Basta to write a marimba concerto for his senior recital project, 1956. Peter Tanner was the teacher at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for a number of years. Mitchell Peters, of course, you've played his pieces along the way. Gordon Peters went on to become principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony. Another student of Musser's is Vita Chenoweth. She gave her debut recital in 1956 in Chicago and then in New York. She went on to commission and premiere Robert Kirka's Concerto for Marimba. Other, on her debut recital, she performed in 1956 in New York. She performed the Creston Concertino and a couple, three etudes, no, four etudes of Musser's, pieces by Momsen, two Toccatas, uh, Bernard Rogers, Mirage, Telemann, Canonic, Sonata number three, two pieces by Ulrich, and a transcription of Villa, uh, Villa Lobos piece. The Kirka was, was written in 1956, but not premiered until 1959. Uh, and the Sarmiento's concerto that Lester mentioned was was actually the winning, the prize-winning piece of a composition contest, concerto contest that Vita Chenoweth sponsored, using some of her her artist fees of a tour of Guatemala. Uh, what else happened in the '60s? Oh, I've skipped over a couple things here. Um, Lady Chenoweth was active from 1956 to 1962. 1962, she gave her, her last recital, a town hall recital, um, and she suffered a hand injury, I believe it was a burn of some sort, which necessitated the end of her performing career. She went into ethnomusicology thereafter. She also released a recording, an LP, in 1956. Other um, international performers, there's a fellow by the name of Wolfgang Pakla, who's Estonian, was performing in Europe. Seemed to have misplaced his photograph. Uh, forgot to put it in. All right. Pakla was playing uh, on an Ajax five octave marimba xylophone. It was made by the Boozy and Hawks Company in Britain. So that was one, one of the more unusual instruments showing up in Europe along that time. At any rate, the next significant thing that happens in regard to the 
development of the marimba was when Keiko Abe started working with Yamaha in Japan. And this is a history page of their marimbas. She helped them, first of all, on the upper left, the 4500 was their sort of improved four octave version. Then by 1974, they developed this first five octave, the, the YM5000. It was a four and a half, sorry, misspoke. Four and a half octave went down to an F, had individually tunable resonators and rosewood end pieces. It's a beautiful instrument. I bought number 12 from Tito Puente and used it for my debut recital in New York. There's a long story there, but we don't have time for it. <laughs> this picture at the bottom left is a, is a close-up of the tunable resonators that were on that particular marimba. Um, Keke was using that marimba on her first American tour in 1977. I heard her play in Alice Tully Hall, and as soon as I saw that marimba, I said, that's so gorgeous, I absolutely have to have one of those. Uh, and the opportunity arose several years later. The next time Keiko came to the U.S., Yamaha had to design this extension that would add on to that four and a half octave marimba to take it down to a low C, and that's what the black and white picture in the upper right is. It's playing with the extension, then by 1984, they finally came out with this one piece, five octave marimba, the 6000. Then what? Ah. Gordon Stout did his first recording. Oh, so 1976, Gordon Stout and Lee Stevens were introduced through the, pace, the first PASIC that happened in Rochester. This is a photograph of Gordon Stout's recording session. You have Joel Leach, who, who was in charge of putting out the actual product. Vera Dalen in later years. Claire Omar Musser. Vera Dalen owned Musser's personal King George Marimba at this point, number 101. Uh, Karen Irvin, who had won the Gaudian, or sorry, had won the um, Geneva competition, no, had placed second, won second prize in the Geneva competition in 1972. Japanese player by the name of Sumide Yoshihara won first prize in that competition. And a young Gordon Stout there. And then in the next photo, a little goofing around on the marimba <laughs> by the same three. Then, so Keiko Abe's first tour to the U.S. in 1977, she stopped it at uh, Oberlin. Here she is playing with Michael Rosen on his on King George that he has. Apparently, she played time for marimba and cracked the low C bar on that occasion. <laughs> um, 1979, Lee Stevens gave his New York recital debut in Town Hall, timed for the New York City hosting of PASIC that year. This was the program. You can see he has the world premiere of John Seri's Night Rhapsody and also of Raymond Helbel's Toccata Fantasy and the New York City premiere of Variations on Lost Love. I have an, a handful of programs here of New York concerts. Vita Chenoweth returned in 1980 after not playing since 1962 or so and gave this recital at Alice Tully Hall. It was kind of an interesting time window back into the mid-1950s as far as the approach to the marimba. She played almost everything with blue musser rubber mallet, or musser blue rubber mallets, including the Bach. <laughs> uh, not the corral, but the, the prelude. Um, it was fascinating to hear her perform. It was just, a, like I say, my, my impression of it was there was this time window sort of back to the 1950s a little bit. Uh, 1991, Michiko Takahashi. Michiko Takahashi is the other <laughs> female Japanese marimbist of significance and of that generation. She won the Gaudiamas competition in 1973. Gaudiamas interpreters competition happens in Rotterdam, uh, and it's a, it was focused on contemporary music. And at that point in time, in the 70s and the 80s, there were, weren't very many competitions that were open to percussionists or marimbists. The only ones were the Geneva competition, which came around every 10 years, 1972, 1982, 1992, uh, and the Gaudiamas competition, which happened for the most part every year. Uh, the catch to the Gaudiamas competition was it was open to anyone, soloists or ensembles up to five. They had to play entirely music post-1945, and they had to play two pieces by Dutch composers. 
you sent in your proposed program and they invited you if they wanted to hear it or not. Uh, so Takahashi was one of the first marimbas to win that competition. In 1974, when she was touring Europe, as a result of that competition, she met Toru Takamitsu, and that led to the writing of his marimba concerto, Gitimaya, for Takahashi. In 1991, she came to New York to show off one of her, her new achievements. She had commissioned Mizuno to make a contrabass marimba extension. She had a four and a half octave kurogi marimba. No, it's, yeah, four and a half octave kurogi marimba that then had an, a half octave extension up to the top, a tiny little outrigger that took it up to xylophone C. And then kurogi built a contrabass extension to go down an octave lower than our usual cello C, went down to contrabass C. <clears throat> and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And she pre presented her New York debut recital. She said, I interviewed her at the time, she said she wanted to come here and show, demonstrate to us how these, these new Japanese pieces were supposed to be performed. But it sort of raised the question about where is anyone else going to get this contrabass marimba to be able to play these pieces? So just to give you a taste of that, this was a, sorry, wrong one, promotional postcard. The contrabass marimba actually only existed in 10 notes. She didn't have a low C sharp or a low D sharp. Each note was its own freestanding unit of a curled wooden resonator on wheels with the bar on top of it. And she could orient them in any way necessary for peace. Sometimes they were in line with the rest of the marimba. Sometimes they were 90 degrees to the rest of the marimba, so she could play them with her left hand while still playing on the regular marimba with her right hand. Uh, I he heard the performance in um, Merkin Concert Hall in the balcony. It's a wonderful hall, fairly small. The balcony sort of closes in to the ceiling. And every time she would play one of the notes in the contrabass range, you would hear this thunk. And then it felt like a different sized truck was driving down West 69th Street right behind you. You would really feel the vibration on your chest more than actually hear a pitch. Other significant debut recitals, Nachiko Makane, Japanese marimbist, won the Gaudiamas competition in 1983 and then gave her New York debut recital. You can see she had some, some of the standard Japanese pieces with a few newer ones. They were unknown to us at the time. I had been commissioning music since 1980, and by 1984, I decided to do my New York debut recital. So here's my program. I was trying for kind of a 19th century sort of photograph there. Uh, here you can see I premiered Richard Ronnie Bennett's After Syrinx II that he wrote for the occasion. Also programmed the U.S. premiere of Hans Werner Henze's Five Scenes from the Snow Country, which had been written for Takahashi, in fact, um, but not played in the U.S. yet. Andrew Porter was the chief critic for The New Yorker, and I knew he was a big Henze fan, so I programmed this piece specifically to get him to come and review the concert, and it worked. <laughs> uh, 1984, I put together the first NEA Consortium Commission with Lee Stevens and Gordon Stout, that led to this performance at Kennedy Center for PASIC that year in 1986. And then in the spring of 87, we did a trio concert in New York. On this concert, you can see the premiere of Merlin by Andrew Thomas. I think one of Andrew's proudest moments was, was at the end of that concert when Jacob Druckmann congratulated him on his piece. Uh, and here's a backstage photo at Kennedy Center just to show that how, how we used to look back in the day. Marimba Lynn made their New York debut in 1987. Here's their program. I have a few more of these programs. Michael Burrett, his New York debut. Joseph Gramley won a competition, East West Artists, which is there were several recital competitions that began to open up to marimbas. Makoto Nakura made the biggest breakthrough when he finally got Young, Cardis, Con Young Concert Artist Series, which is sort of the most significant of the New York recital competitions. Um, 
when I approached them, they just laughed and hung up the phone when I <laughs> said I had some rimbus. Makoto finally made the breakthrough, um, and this was his debut recital. Makoto is a f fine Japanese marimbist. He also was polite enough to, to call and ask for my permission for him to play After Syrinx 2 and Merlin on his debut recital, which I thought was an extremely gracious move on his part. And I'll also comment that Andrew Thomas and I sat together in this concert and at the end of the second movement of Merlin, I turned to Andy and said, you will never hear it played that fast and that accurately again. <laughs> uh, where are we? All right, so then in 2014, the Center for Mallet Percussion Research opened at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania, and this is a shot of one of their rooms. So the quiz is, can you identify the marimbas in this photograph? So you'll see on the far left, with a diamond plaque, a century of progress. Then there are several King George marimbas that have the sort of marbleized pearl on the frame. Canterbury down here in the lower right. Way back in the far corner is a newer Yamaha for some reason. A couple newer Yamahas. <laughs> the sad part is to see the condition that some of these marimbas in, particularly this King George, which is in the front. This is, this is Claire Omar Musser's personal King George. And it's really suffered some wear and tear over the years. So in a way, um, I mean, it's nice that the center is there and it's nice that they're preserving these instruments, but it's really a shock when you see them in this condition as opposed to the way that when you come out of, you send an instrument to Century Mallet Instruments in Chicago, for instance, to be restored, they can basically take it back to what it looked like when it first came off the factory floor. Um, but I suppose it's in keeping when you consider that we're actually well over a hundred years from the introduction of the instrument as we know it, the industrial marimba. <laughs> so we can expect this kind of thing. At any rate, there we are. That's all I have to say on the subject. Bill, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this was incredible. I, I have one question though, and this is uh, for, uh, for my students, uh, probably for a lot of the students. Um, you commissioned, uh, I presume, the uh, uh, the Druckmann piece, uh, Reflections on the Nature of Water. Do you have any inside stories about this? Um, uh, because it and and why has it remained in the repertoire for so long? It's become become uh, one of the most popular pieces since your commission. So, any explanations there? <laughs> um, well, for, I think I would start. Two things that I skipped over in my hurry to finish on a fairly timely metal. One, uh, Keiko Abe, I, in fact, I didn't even mention, Keiko Abe had her three recitals in Japan in 1968, 1969, and 1971, introducing all this new Japanese repertoire that she had commissioned. A recording of that came out in the United States in 72, which was my first year in college. I, I came across it at a closeout, as a closeout bin at a bookstore for a dollar or so. Bought it. Said, "What is going on here with this? This is this is a com completely new way to play the marimba. Wrote off to Japan for the pieces, so on and so forth." Um, at some stage, I said, "You know, someone has to start commissioning American composers to write for the marimba." Mm -hmm. So that was sort of in the back of my mind. My master's recital, I did um, as part of my master's recital. I did Jacob Druckmann's Animus II for mezzo soprano, two percussionists, and four channel tape. Yeah. Uh, and it was that influence saying sort of Druckmann was the first one in my mind that I would really like to commission uh, on a professional level. Of course, I didn't have the funding for that. In 1980, National Endowment for the Arts announced the Consortium Commissioning Program. The initial el eligibility requirements were way too severe for any marimbas to be able to meet. You had to have a certain number of recitals, contracted recitals in three years and so on and so forth. But by 1984, they'd watered down the eligibility enough that I thought it was possible. So I knew that Gordon and Lee and Mike Rosen and myself were maybe the only ones who could put together uh, the necessary number of contracted recitals to qualify. We each went into it choosing one composer. Mine, of course, was Druckmann. Lee's was John Corleano. Gordon's was Roger Reynolds. Mike Rosen suggested Mel Powell, who none of us had ever heard of, Bud Powell's brother. Um, so we passed on Mel Powell. Then he won the Pulitzer Prize a few years later, and I was kicking myself. Um, at any rate, 
uh, I ended up with Jacob Druckmann. We, all three of us were contractually obligated to perform each of the commission pieces twice in the next three years. Uh, but we also matched up one-on-one -on -one about who would actually play the premiere and who would interact with the composer. So Jacob came down to my loft on Chamber Street, and the really delicate part was that I, I knew his son, Danny, who was as a, just finished at Juilliard. Danny's a fine player, but he's not what we considered a, a marimbist at that point in time in the mid-'80s. Uh, and so I had to make the point to Jacob that he wasn't writing for his son. He needed to, needed to be writing for the way that Gordon and Lee and I were playing. Um, I showed him a few things. I remember I, I showed him part of the first Mexican dance, and I maintained that that's what turned into the fourth movement, the reflections. Um, Jacob didn't know quite how many movements he was going to write. He gave them to me one at a time uh, when it was nearing the premiere day at Kennedy Center, he finally said, all right, put them in this order. <laughs> and that's why the program for Kennedy Center doesn't list any of the movements, neither does the, the New York premiere program. Okay. Um, I can't really speak to necessarily why it's so popular of the year. I think it would say, first of all, it's an excellent piece. Second of all, it's not quite as difficult um, as some others that came out around the same time or thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say out of all the pieces I've commissioned, my favorites are Richard Rowdy Bennett's After Syrinx II and Thruckman's Reflections, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great pieces. And, uh, <laughs> and Merlin. Yeah. And, and, oh, yes, of <laughs> course. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you've been responsible for all these pieces, which have, as I say, remained in the repertoire all these years, and uh, we really appreciate it. What I, uh, We have to end. I mean, it's been two, two and a quarter <laughs> hours on this, and uh, as I say, we could we could have gone another eight hours, but um, I, I'd i love uh, all the participants to uh, uh, turn on their videos and unmute themselves and give a nice round of applause to all uh, four panelists for an amazing representation of the history of the marimba or the evolution. Thank you. <laughs> the low angle of me. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, thank, thank thanks you. Thanks very much. And just to Sorry let you know, <laughs> SK Kakraba has mentioned if anybody's interested in purchasing a gil, um he get in touch with him but i think the best thing to do is get in touch with me and i'll give you his email if you have any interest for that so thanks again everyone and um uh take care stay safe and uh maybe we'll see each other live in performance before too long playing the marimba thank you for organizing this Beverly. Thanks for organizing oh, thank you that. oh thanks no problem <laughs> thanks for everything take care Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.